Six-membered rings are among the most common cyclic structures in the world. They're part of nucleic acids, sugars, steroids, and many other important classes of molecules. One of the reasons that they're so common is that they are unstrained. The CC bonds within a cyclohexane can adopt 109.5 degree bond angles pretty easily. But imagine the cyclohexane was entirely flat. You would have six hydrogens pointed all in one direction and six hydrogens pointed all in the other. If we take a look along one of the CC bonds in this conformation, we can see that they are eclipsed. This is not stable. So cyclohexanes are not planar. They rotate their CC bonds in ju just slightly to make all of their substituents staggered and as far apart as possible. We call this most stable conformation the chair conformation because it looks vaguely like a beach chair if you're looking at it from the proper perspective. If you look at this chair conformation from the side, you can see that there are two distinct types of hydrogen atoms. Those pointed vertically, either straight up or straight down, and those pointing angling out to the sides. just slightly upward or downward. We say that the vertical pointing substituents are axial and the sideways substituents are equatorial. Every carbon has one axial substituent and one equatorial substituent, and their directions alternate as we go around the ring. This carbon has its axial substituent pointed up and its equi equatorial substituent pointed downward. The next carbon over has its axial substituent pointed down and its equatorial substituent angled upward, and so on around the ring. In our typical drawing of a cyclohexane, as a hexagon on paper, each carbon has a substituent drawn on a wedged bond and a sub substituent drawn on a dashed bond. By convention, substituents on wedges are either axial up or equatorial angling up, upward. Substituents on dashed bonds are either axial down or equatorial pointed downward. Think wedge up, dash down. Cyclohexanes are shifty little critters, though. Those single bonds within the ring still have some degree of free rotation, and they can twist and turn, wriggle, and get into one other chair conformation, which has all the substituents that had been axial in the first conformation equatorial, and all the substituents that had been equatorial are now axial. This is referred to as a ring flip, and most cyclohexanes undergo them quite easily. And the two possible conformations are in equilibrium with each other. It's important to note that ring flips switch axial and equatorial substituents, not up and down. They don't change up to down. So a traditional drawing with wedges and dashes is ambiguous. It could represent either possible chair conformation. We'll talk about how we resolve that ambiguity in the next video. But first, there's one more question to ask. Why do we care about all this? Well, it turns out that substituent on, on a cyclohexane ring behave and react differently when they are axial versus when they are equatorial. Axial substituents are physically relatively close to other nearby axial substituents. On my model, the axial substituents are about 6.5 centimeters from each other. 
while equatorial substituents are closer to 8 centimeters from their nearest neighbor. This means that axial positions are more sterically crowded, and big groups, therefore, prefer to be equatorial. This means that for a given cyclohexane, there are two possible chair conformations, and the one that has the most and largest substituents in equatorial positions is more stable than the one whose substituents in are the, than those substituents are in axial positions. In fact, some groups are so large that they virtually can't be forced into axial positions. These are known as locking groups. The only one that we'll be concerned with is the tert butyl group. These groups must be equatorial, so they effectively lock the conformation of the cyclohexane in, and, the, and the positions of all the other substituents into place. So how do we differentiate between these conformations? Our usual drawings don't tell us which substituents are axial and equatorial, so they're ambiguous. We need a way to distinguish these conformations, and that's the topic of the next video.